we are looking at the prophets through Advent. Uh, the prophets were people who said, do you see what I see? They saw spiritual things that others didn't. Isaiah was one of those. Isaiah said, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed and all people will see it together. We want to see it together this Advent. I'm excited about Advent this year. Advent is that time for us to gather together to celebrate his birth, uh, the birth of Jesus. Hundreds of years before Jesus was born, uh, God spoke to his people through the prophet Isaiah, promising them a savior. Uh, to communicate God's message, Isaiah used striking, stunning images and surprising images. Isaiah spoke to us the question, do you see what I see? Isaiah pointed God's people to the future when one day through the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus, they would deliver his people from sin and sorrow. And Advent is for us to focus on the one Isaiah's images is, is reading about. Each candle brings us closer to the time when we recall his birth and as well as the second coming. Remembering that Jesus in his parable of Matthew 25, the parable of the ten virgins, is we also want to seek to be wise, to have our lamps ready for the bridegroom who is coming again. As Jesus said, keep watch for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. And so we want to prepare ourselves for that. As we worship our Lord Jesus and recall his coming, we look forward to his second coming as well. Let us also be attentive to his presence in, around us to, to see Christ anew. As Max Lucado said, the one who came still comes. The one who spoke still speaks. May the Lord use this season to draw your family closer to him, that you may know his presence and to see him with a fresh new set of eyes. Do you see what the prophets see? That is our theme in Advent this year. Second Sunday of Advent. Today we relight the candle of hope. Now we light the candle for the second Sunday in Advent. This is the candle of peace. As we prepare for the coming of Jesus, we remember that Jesus is our hope and our peace. From the prophet Isaiah, for a child has been born to us, a son given to us, authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Isaiah 9, 6 through 7. From the Gospel of John, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not let them be afraid. John 14, verse 27. Let us pray. Gracious God, grant that we may find peace as we prepare for our Lord's birth. May divisions in ourselves and in our families be peacefully resolved. May there be peace in our cities and the countries of our world. Help us to see the paths of peace in our lives and then give us the courage to follow them. Lord, let us remember that you are the giver of lasting peace and that you are always with us. Amen. Come, all ye faithful, join. 
joyful and triumphant. Come ye, come ye to Bethlehem. Come and behold him, born the King of angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Come, let us adore. God, it's easy to give ourselves the glory that you alone deserve, to focus on our needs before we come before you and honor and acknowledge you. You are the provider, God. You have met every need that we have already. And Lord, you are in the process of meeting our needs that are yet to come. And in this season of Advent, as we, as we wait for you to come again, as we look forward to you fulfilling your promise to return, we're reminded that your people for generations, for many, many generations, waited for the Messiah. The prophets foretold, and the people had hope, and some generations that hope was nearly forgotten, but you did come. Jesus came. You dwelt among us. So, Lord, we ask that you would help us to, in response to your coming first and your promised second coming, that you would lead us to pursue you, to honor you, to worship you with all that we are. That you would receive the glory is our prayer. Amen. In this Advent season, the first week we focused on the thought of, of hope and where do we find hope. And this week we are looking at the theme of peace and how the peace that God brings is not just an absence of warfare. It is, is it a completion, it is a whole, making whole. The Hebrew word is shalom. And the peace that God gives is a completeness and a wholeness that only comes from him. In 1962, there was a building crisis in the Western Hemisphere. Referred to now as the Cuban Missile Crisis, the, the war, uh, the Cold War was escalating and the tensions of what might happen if someone on the U.S. or the Soviet Union side decided to uh, attack and where that escalate into nuclear war and where would that lead. <clears throat> and in that context, a songwriter wandering through the streets of New York and sensing the the tension and the hopelessness that was there in that time 
wrote a song that has been recorded by many pop stars and as well as Christian artists alike. And it's, their, it's our theme song for this Advent season. It is, do you see what I see? The phrase also goes, do you hear what I hear? I'm going to sing the words, and the words will be on the screen, and uh, invite you to reflect and ask yourself, where are you looking for hope this season? Where are you looking for peace, the peace that Jesus Christ alone can bring? Said the night wind to the little lamb, do you see what I see? Reading from Jonah 3. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, Forty more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah this seemed very wrong, 
and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be angry? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, would you repeat after me? The Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. As high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. Jonah, he wasn't such a great missionary. God tells Jonah to go to Nineveh. Instead, as the Jesus Storybook put, Bible puts it, he buys one-way ticket, not to Nineveh, please. He sleeps on the boat while the pagan sailors call a prayer meeting. And they're the ones to tell Jonah, God isn't on board with this not Nineveh plan. And Jonah isn't on board much longer after that. Jonah, he wasn't an eager evangelist either. Uh, Nineveh was a three days walk circum, uh, in circumference, and Jonah walks uh, partway into the city on day one. He makes a revival speech. It's just five words in Hebrew, eight words in English. Forty more days, and Nineveh will be destroyed. As though he's not expecting anyone to do much about it. Perhaps hoping they wouldn't, but they do. A pay, and a pagan king of Nineveh says more to the subjects about their nature of repentance, the possibility of God's mercy, than even Jonah does. And when God has compassion and relents from their destruction, Jonah is so angry he tries to condemn God of his own gracious character. Like if you lay into a roommate, you know, you always pay your rent on time. I never have to remind you about the dishes in the sink. You, you never are too loud when uh, you get home at night. Uh, you're never too cheerful in the morning. You always ask about beforehand about having parties. You always ask about the people's day, and then you really listen. Ah, you make me so mad. God, you are slow to anger, abounding in love, gracious and compassionate. You're relenting and sending calamity. Ah, how could you? This is the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And God's like, you floated around in the fish's digestive juices for three days. This, this is the worst thing that's ever happened to you. This is what has made you mad. Thomas Carlyle wrote a little book on poems. I think it conveys the message of Jesus better than any giant commentary for example, the poem entitled The Tantrum fits here. It captures Jonah's response to God's mercy. The generosity of God displeased Jonah greatly, and he slashed with angry prayer at graciousness of the Almighty. I told you so, he screamed. I knew what you would do, you dirty forgiver. You bless your enemies and show kindness to those who despitefully use you. I would rather die than to live in a world with a God like you, and don't try to forgive me either. Without saying a word, and it says a lot when a, a prophet doesn't have anything left to say, and Jonah sweeps out of town in an indignant huff. Meanwhile, back in Nineveh, the people are starting to wonder, well, now what? We did our sackcloth and ashes, even our livestock. I mean, no one told us how to do this repent thing, so we figured better to do more than less. But doesn't it feel like there's more to it? Like, what if we got together once a week and talked about God? Maybe we could write songs about God. Maybe, I don't know if this is how it works, but could we, like, talk to God? Does anyone know whatever happened to that guy who told us about repenting? He's probably no stuff about that would be helpful. Anyone seen him around recently? Jonah's a terrible missionary, uh, 
half-hearted, successful, despite himself, evangelist, and now, as a church planter or a pastor, he's literally missing in action. So if Jonah is a kind of seems like a joke to you, well, now you're reading him like a proper Hebrew scholar should. The book uses satire. Jonah, he's complaining to God. I told those people you would destroy the city, and now you're not destroying the city. I'm, I'm just saying it doesn't make me look very good. Jonah's kicking up the dirt as he makes his way out of the city, whining as he goes out of the city. Well, I hope those people appreciate what you've done for them, not that they deserve it. Jonah, he's muttering to himself while putting up the shelter in the east side of the city. That slow to anger, abounding in love thing, supposed to be for us, not for them. We're God's people. They're just those people. A proper Hebrew scholar reads Jonah with humor. A proper Hebrew scholar also reads Jonah as a truthful representation of God's people, mirroring themselves and mirroring ourselves. For all the times that they forgotten the second part of God's promise and the covenant to Abraham that all people on earth will be blessed through you. Jonah, he's the embodiment of God's people and all the time they've forgotten that Jesus says in John 3, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And you know what? That's going to include some of those people. Even in the midst of Advent, Christmas, joy, we prove Jonah to be our truthful representation. It's an issue or a question that presses upon us in a multicultural, multi-religious America, a polarization, political polarization, where there's racial walls and there's so much hatred. We're called into question when our next door neighbor is Hindu or the person at the desk Working next to us is Muslim. We're Christians. We believe Jesus is the Son of God, salvation for all sinners. What are the barriers? What things do we put up? What fences do we put in place? But here's the thing. Because God is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, bounding in love, God looks at us, fuming about, about those people, however you, we define them or you define them, just the same as God looks at Jonah pouting in his shelter and thinks, you know, wait, I can work with that. A plant springs up overnight and throw jo Jonah some shade and retired from his prophetic ministry, living in a blissful distance from those people. Jonah wakes up and immediately he's grateful for the plant friend. Good morning, plant Let's watch and see if the brimstone forecast is for Nineveh today. And Jonah waits all day, chatting with his plant, rehearsing a long list of grievances. And honestly, you know, no other creature would want to listen, but talking to plants is supposed to be a good thing for plant growth, so it's a win-win. As the sun sets, Jonah curls up under the leaf as he's drifting off to sleep. And he says, good night, plant friend. I, I love you. Maybe tomorrow Nineveh will be destroyed. Boy, wouldn't that be great. And when he wakes up in the morning, his plant friend is gone. His comfort is impringed, and by a cruel east wind, Jonah get, again is angry enough to die. But then God, with such tenderness, such gentleness, settles in next to Jonah, impatient beyond all reason, gracious again, abundantly compassionate, bounding in love, and asks, Oh, Jonah, I know you loved your plant. It was my gift to you. But now, Jonah... Don't you think I should get to love those people too? They literally dressed animals in sackcloth for heaven's sake. Lit like literally dressed up cows. And more importantly, they're made in my image. Remember the promise, all people on earth shall be blessed through you. Jonah, don't I get to love those people too? The story of Jonah remains unfinished. The question is left unanswered. Don't I get to love those people too? Will you help? It reminds me of another unfinished story, an unfinished question, a story about a father who loved his sons. He loved his younger son against a better judgment. After all, the younger son wished his father to be dead, and 
He ran away from his home and squandered its money. Still, the father waited for him. One day, the boy came home, and the father was wild with joy. But someone else there, too, he stomped out of the party, kicking up the dust, muttering, That son of yours. The father leaves the party, finds the older boy, and settles in beside him with such tenderness and such gentleness, patient beyond all reason, abundant in compassion, abounding in love. Dear child, I always i have loved you. Everything is yours, but don't I get to love your brother too? Won't you come and join the party? We are living an unfinished story today, waiting for the Christ to return, waiting for Christ's second coming. An unanswered question is for us. It begins with God who creates us and loves the world, every creature endured by God. And even when God's people run in opposite direction, God loves them and chases after them, relentless in tenderness like a parent or a giant fish if it's needed. God sends prophets, even silly prophets like Jonah, and shows them how, just how serious God means when he says, I love the whole world. Until at last, while we still those people, Christ died for us. God loved us, sent amongst us, sent his son amongst defiant kings and lowly shepherds and magicians from the east and by his atoning sacrifice so that in Christ, his incarnation, his life, death, resurrection, and ascension, salvation was begun. In Christ, those dividing walls of hostility were broken, barriers torn down. In Christ, those people become our people. In Christ, we people is the people God loves. We know the end of the story that one day Christ will return. And in Christ's kingdom, we will be one people again, a great multitude, a day when no one can count from every tribe and nation, people and language worshiping together. But until that day, this is the story of Christ through his Holy Spirit that continues for us to tell. A story of God who loves beyond walls. We put up between people. And while we're busy building fences, God is busy loving those on the other side of that fence because God always loves beyond borders that we create. God is such tenderness and such gentleness, settles in beside us, patient beyond reason, gracious, abundant, and compassion, abounding in love and asking us, dear child, all you have is my gift to you. And at Christmas, God's greatest gift, I showed you. And Jesus told you, for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whoever believes shall not perish but have eternal life. The list of whosoever's may be longer than you'd like, but that's simply what it looks like when God so loves the world. Ask of the older son. Ask Jonah. Mercy will be greater than you might like, but God offers it. Dear child, it is for you. Don't I get to love those people too? Would you pray with me? Lord, you are compassionate. You're gracious, slow to anger, bounding in love. You've not always accused, nor will you harbor anger forever. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is your love for those who fear you. God, we give you thanks and praise this Christmas season that you sent your son to this earth, giving to us a gift. Father, may we not be uh, withholding. May we be generous with the grace that you have given and offered to us to those people, those that we have put up boundaries and barriers to. Father, give you thanks and praise for the prophet Jonah. May we, though, not be a reluctant prophet. God, thank you for your grace and love, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.